East-West Opus Part 2 – The Orchestra Hi there, this is Sam with Second Tier Sound, really nice to see you here again. Now, in this second video out of three, I'll delve deeper into how the Hollywood Orchestra, the Opus Edition, really works. I recommend, though, that you watch the first video before you watch this one, if you haven't already, so that you understand how the engine really works. Now, before we get going, I really wanted to say that I had previously made videos about how the Hollywood Orchestra works, but in the Play engine. So, rather than doing that one more time, I thought I will focus on the differences, the additions, and to compare it a little bit with the Play engine as well. If you really wanted to go deeper into each patch, I'll refer you to those older videos. And they are still relevant, because the libraries are very, very similar. But somebody might say, well, the patch names are different, and that is true. So in this video, I will also talk about how you can relate the libraries to each other. Let's start our engines, the Opus engine and the Play engine, so we can compare them a little bit and see if there are any similarities or differences. So let's start with the strings. And immediately we notice that the folders don't add up. There are new instruments here. We have 18 violins and we have ensemble. And in play we have quick start and template, which does not exist in Opus. I kind of miss that actually. But maybe they thought it wasn't necessary because the naming of the patches are a lot easier this way. So it's easier to find things. Actually, let's start looking at that. We'll look at 18 violins long. We don't have them in a play, but it's good that we talk about this for a bit. So there are two important things we need to address before we can move on. And that is the naming of the patches and also how they are controlled. So let's start with the naming. You know, in the Play Engine, they had these long, intricate names that were quite difficult to understand sometimes. But they were doing that so you could have more options. Actually, a lot of these instruments sounded the same. They were just controlled differently. For example, they had different amount of dynamic layers. You could see that with the uh, number at the end, you know, 6 or 3 or 12. Now in Opus, they made that a lot easier. They only have two options, max and light. And it's quite straightforward. The max means all the dynamic layers are there, so you get more detail. And light is about half the dynamic layers, so you can save some RAM. Let's look at an example. If we load the max here, and we're gonna play with the expression layer here. Now, it's hard to hear this on a YouTube video, but basically I have more detail, I have more degrees of volume, you could say, between loud and soft. If I use the light, there's just less of that, but it still sounds all right. So have less choices, less layers of volume. But if you don't care so much about that, you might as well use the light versions because it will save you RAM. Now, that's the first part. What about dynamic control? Now, in order to understand why the things are the way they are, we need to talk a little bit about this. And I hope you stay with me because you will understand more how the patches work and why it became this way. Now, back in the day when East and West was really this really big, massive uh, library that pretty much only professionals could afford, you know, professionals who had the right gear, lots of faders and all that, you know, then it made sense to have the expression for the volume change because, you know, expression is expression and modulation is more for changing the sound uh, that is putting on a vibrato, for example. Now, more and more people started to work with this at home and most of us had one keyboard with maybe one modulation wheel, if anything, and it became quite frustrating to try to control the expression with the modulation wheel, right? So more and more sample libraries started to use that instead, to have the modulation wheel as the main changer of sounds. But East-West stuck with their guns, and they sort of translated this into the new engine, so they can't just change all the patches because that would mess everything up for people who are now using the Opus instead of Play. But it is still true that some of the patches in play had modulation wheel as the control. And those are the patches with less dynamic layers, meaning there were no vibrato control, so you could use the modulation wheel for that. So, what have they done with the Opus engine then? Well, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, and I don't know why, but East-West is not consistent here, and it could be because they have made a mess up and they will fix it, but 
by the time I'm doing this review slash tutorial, it works like this. All the strings, except the new instruments, work like this. Light means that you can control everything with the mod wheel, because there's no vibrato control. Max means that there is vibrato control, and you will uh, use the expression for the volume change and the modulation for vibrato control. Now again, the new instruments don't work like that. The new instruments, all of the patches, light or max, are using vibrato control with the modulation wheel. Now, if you've seen the previous video, you know you can change this really easily, so there's no problem there. One more thing, let's talk about the other libraries briefly so you know how they are controlled as well. Okay, so the winds, all of the patches work this way. All of them have vibrato control on the modulation wheel, and you control the dynamic layers with the expression. In the brass, everything is controlled with the modulation wheel, and that is mainly because there is no vibrato control, not to speak of at least. You could still use the expression if you want to, to have more control. All right, <laughs> I hope you got that. So let's go back to this instrument and let's see what it sounds like. So let's talk about the longs here, the new instrument, the new 18 violins. So we have the light and max, and we're just gonna use the max versions here. The Mercado Sus, and yeah, by the way, you can also look up here if you wanna look further into what it does and how it controls, so it's really nice to have that here. But this has a Mercado on top of the long, so depending on how hard you hit the keys, you will get a different attack. So if I have the low softer, the Mercado is there, but not as strong. If I have harder, you can hear that it's more prominent. So if I lower the expression layer on the longs, I still have the same volume on the Mercado. And then the long comes there. So again, you control the Mercado with the velocity, how hard you hit the keys, and you control the longs underneath with the expression. Right? And then we have Sol Pond Tremolo, which is a very nice Hitchcocky sound. Then Sol Tasto Fa Tando, which is the instant emotion Mysterio starter. Very nice. Sus accent. It basically means that if you hit the keys harder, you get that initial attack. And then this patch does not have the accent. Otherwise, it is exactly the same. All right, let's go into the shorts then. We have a Mercado short. Round Robin 4 means that there are four different versions, four different variations, so it doesn't always sound the same. Right. Then we have a new one that I really like. It's Mercado Vibrato Long. So that means it is a longer Mercado that also has a nice vibrato on it. Very nice. Very emotional, very passionate. And it's also important to use Mercados because it's difficult to have nice endings on notes in string libraries. If you just lift your fingers from a long, it tends to not always sound that good, but this really sounds good. Then we have a lot of repetitions, which is good for exactly that. And then the same with just less repetition, which can be good for two things. You know, you can save some RAM, but also if you have less repetitions, you actually get a different sound, different variations. It's very subtle, but you can play with that. Then we have my favorite. The short modulation speed, that means you control the different shorts with the modulation. So you have four ones, you have the shortest. And then you have a staccato, which is a little bit longer. And staccato and bow, which is almost like a marcado. And then you have a long marcado. So they've changed that a little bit. In the previous library, in the play, the differences weren't that long, but they have extended that a little bit so you have more variety, which I really like. So I still love my mod speed patches. 
Then we have spiccato. Very nice. And the spiccato run script. Always better to program that in, but it, it works really well. I think it's even better than the previous one. And then we have stack runs, which is kind of similar, but just a little bit more attack at each note. You will hear it more if you program it in. Stack slur is good for fast passages. Yeah, I didn't play that well, but it's good for fast runs. You can also, not runs, fast passages that you don't want to use a staccato patch for. I know they call them instruments. I should say that, not patches. Anyway, it's just an old habit. Staccatissimo, which is actually not as short as spiccato, but it's still shorter than staccato. And then we have staccato, which is a little bit longer. Right. Really nice sound. Very, very good. Then we have effects, and they have a new one called Penderecki, which is something that Penderecki, the composer, did a lot himself. I don't actually know exactly how that is done on the violin, but it sounds like kind of a pizzicato, maybe a bow technique. Somebody in the comment can tell me exactly how it's done. Then we have repetition, and this is a new script this time, so it's a little bit cleaner than the one previously in play. Controlled with the expression layer there, and then the tremolo. All right. Then we have legatos, and these are really, really nice. And normally I don't use the ones that only has portamento, but these first ones always use the portamento legato. So. which after a while tends to become too much. So I think it's better to have a mix of them. So here, Slar plus Portamento, you have both of them and you control them with how hard you hit the keys. So if I hit them hard, and then if I hit it softer, I get the Portamento. Which is really nice. Then we have the legato without the portamento. If you don't like that at all, you have that option here. So a lot more streamlined. It's a lot easier to find your patch here than in the previous play, but still a lot of flexibility. Then we have the key switch. I can load it up. Again, I don't use key switches that much. I have nothing against them. They're really good. And in fact, they have really expanded on this one. You have a lot of power here. But I explained more about that in my previous video on how to use the Opus engine. So go to that one if you want to know more on how you can change things around here. It's really, really good. Okay, that's pretty much it for the 18 violins. So let's look at the ensemble as well. So the ensemble is actually the whole orchestra and not just strings. So I wonder a little bit why they put it here. But it doesn't matter. It's a really great extra tool. It's kind of like a sketching tool. It reminds me a little bit of how they did it in Symphobia 1 and 2 by Project Sam. So these are good for creating big, nice chords. Let's see. And really nice dynamic layering. Now we have Saltasto, which is similar to the other one. And then sus accent, which you have an accent if you want to. More with brass there. And then you also have mutes. So I'm doing all those swells with the mod wheel, by the way. All right. And then we have the accent with mute. And then we're just a normal. Right, and then we have short, we have a staccato mute. And the shorts are controlled with the velocity layer, but you can obviously use the expression as well for more control. 
and then staccato without the mute. Maybe down here is better. Whoops. Anyway, then we have a staccatissimo with mute as well. And without the mute. Yes, very nice. And then also a key switch. So it's really great for filling up the orchestra a bit, perhaps some background sounds or just for sketching. But just a tip from a fellow composer, be careful hitting too many keys at the same time. It can sound cool, it definitely can, but if you have these big voicing chords, you know. It tends to not sound real. It tends to become like church organ sound. You know, it's too many... Uh, it just it doesn't sound real anymore. So I would not go more than three or four voices when you use this chord. Just a tip, you can obviously do whatever you want. So in terms of the rest of the instruments, I won't have time to go through them all because it will be the longest video ever. But I've already made those videos, but within the play engine. So go and check those out if you really want to know. But let's also look a little bit at what they have done with the names. You see, there's a lot of options here, but what they have removed in the play engine, let's open up here, for example, is that they don't have the niente. It's no need to put that anymore. They don't have the dynamic layers, but otherwise they pretty much have, you know, it says light, that means light, max they don't say, but otherwise it does say legato, slur, and portamento and all that. So you will still understand because the names are similar. They just removed a few things, especially all the numbers here at the end and niente, okay? But another thing they've done is that they have a little bit less folders. You see here in the violins, quite a lot of folders here. Well, in this one, it seems like there is less. Well, they don't need, we don't need a long, powerful system anymore. Nobody has a computer that can not handle the long, powerful system samples. So they're all in there. The biggest ones are in here now. We don't have both short, tight and short, loose. We only have a short because we don't need both versions. We have the best one is here, the one that is loose. Then effects, same. Then we have legato slur portamento, same. Bow change, the same. Key switches, the same. Uh, there it is. We don't need the powerful system. All right, it's there. So just let's just load up one of the heavier patches and compare it with play to see how it sounds and all that stuff. So let's go to legato slur portamento. And we're gonna take this one here, the one that has both slur and portamento, the max one. Let's load that one up. Yeah, it loads fairly quickly, 1.6 gigabyte. And let's load this one up here as well. Let's try a powerful system just in case. So we make sure, take the biggest one here. We take slur plus portamento. Let's load that one up. And it loads fairly quickly in play, even though not as fast as the Opus. The reason this one loaded a little bit faster now, it is because I've already loaded it before when I was working with this, otherwise it takes a little longer. All right, so in play here we see this is about one gigabyte, while here it's about 1.6 gigabyte. So in general, I wanna say that the patches in Opus are about 30 to 40% bigger. And that is probably because they've added more transitions, more legatos, they have reworked those. So let's just listen to the sounds of these two patches that are very similar to each other. Okay, so here is the Opus engine. Okay, and let's listen to the play. Did you hear any difference? It's very subtle. And that is because they are the same samples. They are the same recordings as before. They've just manipulated them a little bit. And one of the ways they've done that is volume. This is really how loud the play really is. When you open it up, that's how loud the play really is. I had just lowered the volume so it matches more the play, so you can hear the difference more easily. I suspect they have altered the EQ a bit on some of the instruments. I'm not entirely sure, but I do feel like the winds are quite different. And another thing is that they really have changed the legato transitions for the better. 
And that is probably one of the reasons why the instrument patches are way larger now. Another thing that I think not a lot of people think about is that unless you have changed it in the preferences, Opus preloads with a reverb every time we load an instrument. And that actually changes the sounds. It sounds better, right? Because in play, it doesn't happen that way. So it sounds drier unless you put on your own reverb. So if you compare directly without unchecking or checking the reverb, you might feel like, oh, Opus is more full now. So think about that. Uh, I personally don't preload the reverbs. They're not bad. I just prefer to have one reverb that is sort of one room and it takes less resources that way as well. So as you can see, very, very similar sound. One thing I noticed though, which is hard to show, it is really the transitions. So if I play with the Opus, Now, this is just a physical sensation, so maybe I'm imagining this, but I do get the sensation that when I play the legatos on the Opus engine, it feels lighter, it's easier to be on time. And I think that has to do with the legato transitions. While in play, I often feel like I'm slower and it's heavier to play. It sounds the same, it's just more difficult to play because the transitions are reworked in Opus. So that is the main difference. So let's take a short look at the solo instruments. And because we are working with strings, let's start with violin and cello. So I have to be completely honest here. I didn't use the cello and the violin solo instruments in the play engine because I actually didn't think it sounded that good. And so we're working with my memory here. So you have to take this with a grain of salt if there's a difference or not. But from what I remember, it feels like they sound a little bit better now. But in any case, whatever you think of them, they are actually a great value because maybe you don't think they sound good on their own, but they would work really well as a first chair player in your instrument. So mixed in with the orchestra, it works really nicely. But let's listen to the solo cello a little bit. And I really think that the best patches here to work with is the legato ones. The short ones are okay, they were recorded, but it doesn't give you that same flexibility, I think, as the strings. So let's look at the legato here. There's no doubt that the recording is really nice. It's, it's really well done. It has a nice sound. But I feel like the technology is outdated and it doesn't really catch up with what you can get on the market today. But if you're not as spoiled and picky as I am, then maybe there's still a great addition to orchestra. We can try um, the bow change as well. And I don't feel like the legato is that great here. But, you know, experiment. You have a few different patches and it really matters how you play. So you have to learn each patch well and see what works, what kind of playing. Then you will get some good results out of these. All right, the violin. Let's listen to the legato here. We have legato slur, which is sort of the main patch for most things. So when you play too fast, it doesn't really work, but quite fast you can play. So if you want to go faster, you can work with the legato runs. I messed up there a little bit, but that works really well. For fast passages, this is a great little patch. And then if you want to do more lyrical and slow, they have the lyrical vibrato, which is really nice for that, actually. But if you play too fast, you hear it immediately. So you have to go slow. There's 
very emotional and dramatic. So on top of an orchestra, it will sound really good. So again, I just want to say I'm not entirely convinced by this instrument. I still think it's not the greatest, but as a part of the orchestra, as a first chair, then it really works and I think it's great value. But if you want to do a solo, solo instrument, I think you have to look elsewhere. So, I wanted to briefly mention the harp as well, which is a really nice instrument, but it is exactly the same as play. They have added a folder here which says key switch, but this patch existed before in the maestro patches. It was here. Otherwise, it's a very good instrument with a lot of options. It doesn't have any runs. But it has pre-recorded glissandos. And if you want to learn more about the harp, I have already made a video about it. And it's exactly the same as before. So it works fine in play and in opus. About the percussion. As far as I can see, it's exactly the same as before. If you want to know more how this library works, I've already made a video about this library. It's in the Play Engine, but it works exactly the same in Opus. The only good thing is you get the descriptions here to say more what it's about. Otherwise, it's exactly the same library. So let's take a look at the winds in both Opus and in Play. If you really want to know what all these instruments sound like, I refer you to my older video again so you can listen to all of them. Otherwise, these libraries are identical, except for the small changes, obviously. And one of those are the naming of the instruments. But it's otherwise pretty much the same, and you will figure it out easily. So let's talk a little bit what happened with Opus. Well, Play had a lot of problems in their winds library. Facing issue was the biggest one. It sounds like several instruments instead of one. When you have a solo instrument, EQing wasn't the greatest, and some of the legatas weren't so cool either. So... It feels like they have fixed all of those problems in Opus, but they've also added something that was missing in the Winds library, and that is ensemble patches. This is really important because you can't just put several solo instruments on top of each other, like three solo flutes. It will sound really weird because those samples are identical, so it won't work. So you need sample uh, performances, uh, you need ensemble performances where the musicians are sort of tuning to each other, course correcting as they play, which will create a good and natural facing that you really want to create that bigger sound. And also it sounds louder. So now the f one flute doesn't have to fight against the orchestra because you can have, for example, three flutes. So they've added three bassoons, three clarinets and three flutes. Let's listen to the three flutes. And my personal preference is that when you have three instruments playing at the same time, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use the long ones because if you add more notes, you double the players, like you have six or nine players. And Hey, maybe that's what you want. You want 9 or 12 players at the same time, but it tends to not be the most natural sound. So I'm going to use the legato here. So it sounds really nice, this sound, but I also want to really stress the importance of having three flutes, because if you only have one, that flute really has to fight to be heard. It has to be on the maximum dynamic all the time. But now three flutes can be more relaxed and still be quite loud. So let's look at the three bassoons and see what they sound like. Yes, it's a good recording. It sounds very good to me. So somebody might say, hey, wait a minute, I hear lots of facing here. Yes, that is real and good and natural facing that you do want in order for it to sound more realistic. And that happens when several players play against each other, course correcting as they go. Let's try the three clarinets as well, legato. Very good sound. But let's hear what it sounds like if I have just a solo clarinet. Have they managed to take care of the problems there? Mm -hmm. 
I would say yes, they have. But let's listen to what it sounds like in the play so you can hear what the difference really is. Oh, sorry, we, we want to use that clarinet. There we go. I hope you can hear that there's a lot of facing going on here. That makes it sound like there are two players playing, which could be cool if you want that. But in general, it's really disturbing the sound. So let's listen to the opus again. So it's much, much better. I do want to say I've never heard a scene in library that has managed to remove the facing issue entirely. It does seem to be very difficult, if not impossible. The only one I've heard is more of a synthetical library that manages to do that, but then it's not sample-based. So they have done a lot of good stuff here. They have reworked the legato transitions. They have removed a lot of facing. They have changed the EQs. And it also seems like they have balanced the volume to match better. I, I felt like in the play, some of the wind instruments were too loud, actually. So now it feels more even. So I would say this is a win. So let's take a look at the brass section. And at first glance, you might think they are pretty much identical, right? Yeah, I would say that's almost true, because if it ain't broke, why fix it? The brass in play is still a very, very good library. But they've added a couple of things here that really improve life a little bit. What have they done? Well, they have now a two trombones EXP, and they also have a two trumpets EXP, which is different from the other two trumpets. Let's talk about those. Well, the two trombones is really good because in the play engine, there was only one trombone or three. And you needed something in between, something that sounded good, not too big and not too thin. And also, I think that the sound in the trombones weren't the best part of the brass library. So let's look at a long patch here and see what that sounds like in the play engine. If I play a chord... It starts off nicely, but then when I go up to the louder parts, it starts to become very nasal and nasty. And that's partially because it's a solo patch and it doesn't really work so well playing chords on. But let's try the two trombones and the bass trombone and do the same thing. And it sounds much better, obviously, because it's a patch that is made for that. But let's look at the opus instead. Two trombones, long and max here. I think it sounds way fuller, not so nasty and more like a real trombone. And it's a perfect complement between the solo and the three part. So I really like to have that. And also notice that the dynamic layer works way better. It doesn't come so late, you have more options. So it's much more detailed sound. So that's excellent addition there. I also do want to say that there is no legato in these two trombones. And I think that's a shame, really, because it's a good sounding instrument. And I wish it was a legato here as well. So I don't know why Eastwood hasn't include that. So let's look at the two trumpets EXP. And why do they have that? Because they already have two trumpets. Well, it's because of the dynamic layer. A lot of people complain that the trumpets in the brass of East-West weren't loud enough, not for that big, massive superhero brass. So I believe that's what they have gone for here. If we listen to the two trumpets in play, we can take a log out of this time because they do have that. Now that's the loudest dynamic layer there, and as you can hear, it's fine, but it's not very loud. So let's listen to the two trumpets here. Legato, Max. Well, that's quite a difference, but maybe it's a little bit too loud. Well, let me tell you what I mean. There's the perceived volume, how loud an instrument is in relation to others. 
but there is also the sound of loudness, the dynamic layer. And the dynamic layer is absolutely fantastic. It's so needed. But the actual volume, the, the sound, the perceived volume in comparison to the other instruments, I feel like I'm turning it down quite a bit. So maybe they're still mixing on that. Or maybe it's supposed to be that loud. I don't know. But it's good. I've also noticed, though, that this patch, at least this one here, has an automatic staccato in it, built in. So if you play on lower volumes, you will hear it more clearly. So I feel like that patch could be a little bit smoother, to be honest. It works at louder parts. But at soft parts, I've already told East West about this, but I wonder about that. Otherwise, I'd really like the sound when it's louder. I think the light patch behaves a little bit differently. Yeah. So here, there is no staccato layer. Uh, so use that one if you want smoother legato and if you don't want that attack. So that's the main difference here. Maybe it could be a little bit clearer. But otherwise, it's a really, really nice sound. And that's about it. That is the East-West Hollywood Orchestra, the Opus Edition. So let's talk a little bit about, is this a good value? Should you upgrade? What is the main difference between play and Opus? Well, hopefully you have a better idea about now. And if you have the subscription, this is a no-brainer. Absolutely, there's no need to use play. I mean, it's upgrading immediately, right? But let's say you, for example, bought the whole diamond or gold version in play and you have these libraries, should you upgrade? Well, it's not an easy question. I do want to say that I think the Opus engine is really, really good. From what you've seen from the previous video, and we haven't talked about the orchestration yet, which will be the next video, the third video. So that also is an added value. But if you just look at the orchestra, if you're going to be completely honest here, there is not a lot of difference between these two libraries. It's basically the same library. Yes, they have upgraded the legato transitions. They have added a few instruments, not that many. And they have reworked, reworked some of the EQs. So it sounds better. I mean, I think it's way better. I'm way more happy with the Opus than Play. But it's still a matter of the upgrade cost, which is still quite a lot. I mean, if you were buying the whole library completely new, you've never used the Opus or Play before, I do think this is a good value. You get a lot for your money. You get a whole orchestra, you get solo instruments, you get the orchestrator, and it's a very cohesive library that offers you a lot of bells and whistles and stuff under the hood to play around with so you can really make it yours. So buying it new, yes, it is a good deal. Upgrading... I don't know, it's hard for me. If you have the money and you really f love East and West, then perhaps it's a good deal. But if you feel like, yeah, it's an okay library, then maybe I can't really justify the upgrade cost even with the reduced rate as it is right now. Because you kind of buying the same library again. A library that is way better, a library that is better to use, and absolutely other... Uh, orchestration, other companies who do sample libraries, they, they do repackage their sample libraries too. So East and West is not alone in this, and they're not doing anything bad. This is normal practice, and things need to be updated. But just think about that. If you really love it, if you really like what you've heard, and if you think it will be so much easier to work with, yes, then upgrade to Opus. If it's not your main library, you don't care too much, then maybe you don't need it. If you have the subscription, there's nothing to talk about. But we do also have the orchestrator, which is really something. I really enjoy that. So that's going to be the next video, the final video, and perhaps that will change your mind as well. So until then, I just wanted to say if you enjoy these videos if, and if you want to see more, then I really need your support. So watch more of my videos, hit that like button, write a comment that can be really nice and helpful. Let me know what you need or want or your questions, or maybe you can help somebody else. Share my videos, 
But also, if you really want to support me and if you feel like you can do that and it makes sense to you, you can always join my Patreon or you can also send me some money via PayPal so I can create better videos for you and serve the community better. But until the next video, I hope you enjoy this. This has been fun. So until next time, this is Sam signing out. Take care.